Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Cladocast episode 83. I'm Steve Tudor. I'm Andy Lewis. And I'm Rory Summers. And of course, we are a man down, which we were expecting, to be honest, yes. uh, because uh, Mr. Cage is with his young Sam. Mm-hmm. He's finally got home. I've seen the photographs. John looks absolutely knackered. He also looks really um, big compared to Sam, actually. <laughs> One of the things I remarked on is you can tell John is knackered because his hair's fluffy. Oh, oh really? Is that a thing? He hasn't filled it with poly cement. Yeah, because John uses like a gallon of you know hair product every morning, and you know you can tell when he's knackered and can't be bothered. So he's either hungover or uh, you know obviously dealing with a three-week-old child. <laughs> nice. Oh well. Yeah. So Mr. Cage is currently asleep. Probably. Well, probably, yeah. Oh, I don't miss those days. Oh, yeah, you've quite <laughs> the other side it, it, now, haven't you? Oh, in some ways, I do miss those days when they can't talk back or ignore you. <laughs> when they actively ignore you, that's actually probably worse. <laughs> it's like having cats. They just actively ignore you. Yeah. Oh. But this isn't going to be a podcast about parenting. As much as I feel a rant just on the tip of my tongue about the fallout, I'm not going to do it because it's going no, to be don't. really boring. So, Yes, yes, it is. And I will remove you from the Skype channel. <laughs> <laughs> so is it easier to wrangle um, two children or a party of adventurers? Oh, crikey, that's a tough question. That's a really tough question. Can I come back to you on that? I'm going to need to think about it and possibly do like a pros and cons list. <laughs> we'll come back to well, you at the, the end that, of the cast. <laughs> the reason I asked that is because that was to lead into the first item, uh, which was Comic Relief played Dungeons & Dragons this week. They did. They did. Did they? Which was, uh, yeah, which streamed on Twitch. There was a bunch of British comedians and a, um, I would call him professional dungeon master, to be honest with you. Mm. So it was Sue Perkins, um, oh, Sarah no, Pascoe, Nish Kumar, and um, oh, what was the other chap's name? He's quite... Ed, 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 Ed Gamble. Ed Gamble and um, Greg Davis' get Death Mask. Yes. Which was trending on Twitter quite highly. <laughs> it was. There was, oh, there was a, quite a lot of confusion on Twitter because there was also Dim Javidson just one of the uh, the characters and if you, if you if you were watching this that near the start of the uh, adventure they basically encountered someone with a racial attitude so basically a racist so the the comedy was obviously to avoid various litigation activities this character was named Dim Javidson for some reason <laughs> <laughs> and there were various other things twisted um, trending on twitter as well which i thought was quite funny but yes it was it was to raise money obviously for comic relief um, which it did very, very well. Actually, I think their goal was to get ten thousand, but it went, as far as I'm aware, well in excess of twenty. I didn't watch it to the uh, end. The last count I heard, well, according to the website, they've raised twenty three thousand nine hundred and forty pounds. Is that just for the D and D? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Wow. However, Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons team offered to match the first ten grand. Wow. Pretty cool. So the final total is £33,940. That's pretty good for a couple of hours of basically pissing about. And it was... Yes. Uh, so so I, I missed this. I didn't watch it at all. or didn't even know it was happening, to be honest with you. Um, but what was it like? Were they were they actually like d and Ding? Did they know what they were doing or did they kind of have to be talked through it? Yes, no, and yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> was it the thing of like make an athletics check and then someone has to explain where the athletics section of the skill sheet is? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but what he'd done as well is he'd obviously prepped them a little bit and he'd made sure all the dice they had were different colours. Ah. So, for instance, it was like the black die was the D20, so mm-hmm. it was always, you know, roll the black die, add, add your athletics ability to that. And they were and to be fair... They all looked like they'd flicked through the character sheet and knew what was on there beforehand. So there was a little bit of what you're saying, but it seemed to go a bit smoother. I also got the impression that Sue Perkins has played before. I got that impression as well. She seemed to be taking it much more 
seriously than the rest mm. of them and she'd get yeah. into a little bit more ed did pretty well actually he seemed to pick it up pretty quickly i think sarah pasco seemed to be a little aloof um because she did need a little bit more coaching but she did quite well and nish kumar just seemed to be actually stoned for pretty much all of the session <laughs> <laughs> but color coded mm. dice that's a good tip yeah Mm. That was that was a really good thing, and they did say at the beginning um, that it was a just kind of stripped down version mm. of D anD. d It wasn't the full version. Okay. So yeah, so that there was no um, to just make it a little bit easier, make it a bit quicker. It was obviously quite a you know stripped stripped down adventure as well. Yeah, it was a lot simpler. I mean, one of one of the the, the um, optimizations that they used was that instead of you know rolling twice as many dice for double when you you score a, a crit, they basically just worked out the damage and doubled it. It was okay. it was just that side of things, just to make things a little bit snappier, a little bit quicker for telling. No, and I, I think, think that can make sense. It worked. I think for non D and D, you know, watchers, viewers of this, you might you might be watching for the comedy and to support comic relief rather than to watch a game of D and D. So you might mm. not want to get bogged down in the minutia of the details on how to play yeah Mm -hmm. you could definitely tell there were two types of audience because it was on twitch there's all the comments and stuff going up on the Mm -hmm. right hand side you could follow all of that online and there were definitely two camps of audiences the ones that were just basically watching it for a laugh Mm -hmm. and there was the nerds like us watching it for all the D&D aspects because there was a lot of people who didn't get all the references because there were things to references to like Drist and Minsk and Boo and Mm -hmm. um, various bits and things on telly like Tiger King and um, say Dim Javidson and various other things like that that some of the a lot of the nerds got. They even even the, the DM even got in touch with the audience because he couldn't remember the stats for a horse halfway through the game. Oh, no, 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 it, it wasn't. He couldn't remember. It was one of the stretch goals. Apparently, they had stretch goals all the way through, and one of them was when they reached a certain point, he's not allowed to read his notes. Oh, that's right. Oh, so, so he was doing this. He was in the middle of a massive combat and wasn't allowed to read his notes. So he basically said, "Audience, what's the hit points for a horse or whatever it was?" Mm. And then the chat filled it up. But the, the way the chat exploded when Boo appeared, bloody mm. hell! Oh yeah, that was incredible. <laughs> and, the, and and a goose as well. They mentioned the goose, and the entire audience just start typing honk 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 honk. <laughs> Bizarre. That's cool. See, when you said stretch goals, I thought it would be like when they hit a certain target the players would get horses and then they'd get magic weapons and they would be oh, more, no, more no, no. ludicrous. It was, it was sillier ones. It was ones the other way. Like when it hit a certain funding goal, one character would be f- a cursed and the curse had been voted on by the audience beforehand. Right. So um, Nish got hit, uh, hit by a whirlwind of bread rolls and that just like <laughs> carried on all the way through it and got sillier and sillier. <laughs> Okay. Um, then the other one was you had to vote on who was going to be the final monster, and if you donated, you could vote on it. And it was a simple system; you could only vote if you donated. So yeah, makes sense. Hmm. I thought it was actually quite a good success, and even Amanda watched it with me for about two hours. Hmm. Which <laughs> it did get more and more chaotic as it went on, though, because it got getting they cramped they ramped up the silliness because of these you know stretch goals. An audience participation, which did mean it just got more and more chaotic as the game went on. Crikey. And they were all drinking as well, so... so <laughs> and who was... The DM was pissed. Yes, he was. <laughs> so who was the DM then? Because was it, is, was it like you say, it was a professional DM? So was it like a d uh, professional DM or was it like no, a... No, no. His name is Paul Foxcroft mm-hmm. and he runs another D&D... Um, like live thing called questing time okay uh which is with another bunch of comedians and i don't know who the comedians right. are because i can't find any actual details about questing time because he's got one of those things that his link on his twitter page goes to patreon which means it doesn't tell you anything unless you give him money uh. and it's really annoying but i'm looking at the photograph and it looks like one of the guys is the guy who designed that rock band game that came on the t-shirt i'm not entirely sure oh wow really yeah I was going to say, to, you'd have to be a, probably a, a professional broadcaster of some description and a professional DM to be able to handle that amount of chaos and audience interaction and dealing with com- you know, professional comedians and the whole stretch goal. That I, I would probably have a stroke if I tried to do something like that. <laughs> the, the, the attitude to take is if you ever look at the Adventures League stuff mm. for D&D, 
you know, Adventures League stuff is stuff that's written to be played in a store and it's to take like two hours or to be played at a convention where you've got this you know, time slot and they usually mm. write specifically the convention and they're very, very bare bones adventures. Okay. Oh. And that's the way they do it because, you know, when you write an adventure yourself, you know your players can make what you thought was a five-minute encounter last through the whole session. You know, mm, Saturday night springs to mind. They can make shopping <laughs> last an entire session. That was yep. a yep. Thank you. Yep. Saturday springs to mind. <laughs> oh, you, you've you done this shopping session. Have yeah, you I gave them some money at the end of the last session. I was like, and they're all new. So I was like, you guys have got some money. You've got some. You've got some dosh now, and you're in a town. You're in a decent-sized town, so you can buy anything that's in the book. So I sent them a cutout of the, the player's handbook. And that was just, that was 40 minutes of our session just gone as they argued oh, about dear. stuff. I'm going to buy 10 med kits. Why are you going to buy, do you even know what's in a med kit? No. All right. It's got 10 like portions. It's got 10 uses. So do you really think you're going to need a hundred instances of saving death throws? No, you're not. Look at the book. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't get me started. But <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, well, we almost TPK'd, so... Did you? Yes. And this is in what game were you playing? This is Andy's game of uh, the Essentials Kit. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's the Essentials Kit. The, the, the adventure itself is called the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. Uh, so it's a bit like the Mines of Fandelva, or Fandelva, or whatever you want to call it. Fandelva. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's um, it's a, a beginner's adventure, introductory adventure. It takes you to level six by the end of it. You start at level one, and it's just an introductory go on lots of quests, get yourselves level up, get yourself introduced to the game with sort of yeah. baby's first quest, at least to start with. But it does ramp up quite quickly. It's um, the style of it from playing it, because I'm playing it as a player. I've got it, and I've, I've got to admit, it's taken all my willpower not to skip through that book. Now it's on, you know, it's on my shelf behind mm. here. <laughs> um, it feels like it is very much a much better written beginner game than Fandelvar was. Really? Fandelvar. Yeah. Even though that was a really good adventure, mm. this tones it down even more because basically it works like a like a computer game quest board, doesn't it? Yeah, it's exactly that. And to be honest, it is very well written because of that, because at the start, essentially there's lots and lots and lots of chapters in the game that basically say, you know, this is this, this, this quest, and it gives you all of this, this location, here's the map, and it tells you all about the map, all locations on the map. It even tells you this, because the the, the players have the freedom to go pretty much wherever they want mm. at this point, there's no, there is literally not nothing I can do as the DM to kind of shepherd them down a particular path other than restrict where they can go to a point, mostly because they aren't high enough level and they just get their asses handed to them even more so than they did on Saturday, but they can choose where they want to go, which means, A, it's difficult for me as the DM because I've got to kind of know all of the book in my head at once because they could go anywhere, but also it gives you each of these locations. It tells you this this encounter is balanced for, for characters of this particular level. Characters of low, lower levels may struggle. If, the, if they rest a lot, they'll be okay, or if they're cautious, and let characters of higher level, you'll probably find it a breeze. But um, it tells you, and you can scale it in certain ways, in, certain, in, in different conditions, which is really, really good. And it gives you the background. It gives you the reason things are there, and it gives you the... It doesn't give, obviously, every outcome, because it can't. But, yeah, it is. It's nice and succinct, and it works really... It's really well written. I'm not left wanting much from it, to be fair. Hmm. He says That's... confidently. I'll, I'll come back to you once we've finished it and see how what else happens. We haven't broken it just yet, then. No, you haven't. No, no. It's It's been okay. Um, I'm waiting for you as an experienced player, Steve, to just go off on one. You almost have. I'm not going to tell you how, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh, shit, please don't do that. I haven't got anything like that prepared. <laughs> you almost did on Saturday. No, no, he hasn't. Thank God for that. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, it would have been okay if you did what I thought you might be doing because I do know the area of that of this particular adventure very, very well. But I'd be pulling a lot out of my ass if you did what I thought you were going to do. <laughs> but yeah, so so far it's been pretty. We've played what three sessions, four sessions. So yeah. you guys are getting quite a few games in then. Have you had four sessions in what two weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks. Okay. Yeah, we've played Wednesday nights. And we played on Saturday because we couldn't do last Wednesday, and then we're going to be playing again on this coming Wednesday. So yeah, yeah. I think it's four. It might be three sessions. I think it's four. Yeah, it's three actually. It's yeah. three. Okay. Yeah. So it's the standard, you know, start up seven half seven and then play till ten ish. So but see, we're we're doing good. we're all parents that are playing, so we're doing start at nine and finish at around midnight. 
Right, yeah, sure. Which yeah. which is which is terrible for Kira since she has work at the weekends. On a, so we play Friday night and she goes to bed at midnight. Yeah. Not happy oh, on a Saturday morning. Mm, <laughs> Ooh, yeah. That's not good. It's the price you pay. Two of the players are absolutely brand new. So this mm. is the reason I'm running it, because they're friends of Alora's from sort of skating and they've heard that I've been a DM in the past and played D and oh, Andy, can you can can we play D D? Mike. Yeah, sure. I could be your DM, and so that's where it kind of all went from. So, um, two of the players are really absolutely brand new to this, to Roll Twenty, to D and D, to the universe, to everything. They've never done a role playing adventure before, so they have to pick the fucking complicated one, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> I that one of my one of my new players, new new players, has chosen a wizard, and I was like, oh, I've had to. I really don't. I don't like wizards. Just from a, from a player point of view, I was I was scared to even think about picking a spell caster, let alone a wizard. <laughs> and now as a GM, I'm looking at this and I just, I find them really complicated, but I have to know all of this stuff to help yep. him out. And here's a question for you then, right? With wizards, getting into quite a nitty gritty D&D question here now, guys, is they when they level up, they can pick two spells of their new spell casting level. And the only other way they get spells is if you, the GM kind of litter their path with scrolls for them to pick up? Spell and spell books. I feel, okay, right. I don't like wizards even more. Because it feels like there's a lot of onus on the GM to provide the player with the tools they need to then play the game. Because if you don't do that, if you, or if they miss it, if they don't open that chest or whatever, that's it. They've, they've passed it by. That's, that's a, lot, yep. a lot, lot of responsibility. They get new spells at roughly the same rate as most other spellcasters. Mm. They just have the opportunity to get even more, mm. but it costs them as well. Yeah, like I've 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 dangled a brand new spell book right in front of Steve right near the start of the adventure, and he's like, "Oh my god, this is fantastic!" And then realizes I can't have any of these because I want the f***ing money to scribe them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a very old school D and D thing: the wizards and the spell book yeah. and doing the spell books. Remember, like original D and D, you didn't have as many character classes as you do. So you didn't have the old sorcerers and warlocks and all that. It was basically, it, Wizard was your only spellcaster. Oh. And when I played AD&D 2nd Edition, what you also did is you had the spells in the main rulebook. And if you had any spells in an expansion, you'd let the players have them via finding the spellbook. Okay. So there was a double thing then. There was this double thing of like, oh, hang on. The spell isn't even in the player's handbook. What the hell is this? There was a genuine moment of, what is this spell? This is something new and exciting and interesting. Ooh. As having played a paladin, I level up in my, my, my spell casting. I level up to the next level of spell casting. I get new spells and I can pick any of these spells. But with the wizard, mm. you level up, you can pick two of them. Everything else has got to be gifted to you. Mm. They get other stuff as well, to be fair. Mm. All right. Yeah, they get, depending on which school they've picked, you also get your school your, your school stuff as well. Yeah. Which is uh, gets some interesting stuff. Oh. I was going to talk about this later, but we haven't, we've only played one game, so it's worth mentioning. We also played Alien this week. Yes. Mm. And I've got to admit, I wanted to play some other RPGs because I wanted to get a little bit of a palate cleanser from D&D and learn some other stuff. And all this kind of talk about character classes and levelling up and all these spells... <laughs> they just seem really, really weird when you play another RPG system because it's just, you know, this this this, this in-depth, gritty detail of D&D mm. and then you go play something like Alien and it's just like, yeah, you might level up two or three times, which means you get, like, one skill point and that's it. Mm. It's so much simpler, but that that's kind of a good thing because I, I played in, in, in the, the Alien game because Steve was the DM for this and it was really good. Um because yeah, there's there's so much less focus on the rules. Because I mean, D and D is a very mechanically based game. There's lots of rules, lots of fiddling mm. around, lots of making sure you're five feet away from something, and blah 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 blah. Whereas in Alien, it's a lot more free form. Yeah, it's not the only game like that, but it's 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 which means you've got a lot more flexibility to do whatever you really want as a character, obviously within reason. But it does mean there's a lot more focus on on role playing, which as a player for me that suits me down to the ground because I find role playing so much fun. 
rather mm-hmm. than just pissing about with, you know, what do these rules do? And, oh, you've got to do this and you can't do that because you've got this and you need these tools because, you, sh- you know, you're trying to do something stupid, etc. Rather than just go, nah, Andy, you can't do that. Or you've got to sort of chat your way through it. There's a, but with Alien, there's it's almost like a semi-cooperative board game in that everyone has not necessarily a secret mission, but they've got kind of an agenda or something that's trying to drive them. And okay. it means that you don't really fully trust everybody on the team, <laughs> which is brilliant. Is that is that what that the that's what it's called? It's called an agenda. And it yes. It, yes. And it is a secret objective that your each player has. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I like the sound of that already. Alien can be played in two ways, which is uh, cinematic or campaign. So campaign is a long-form game, supposed to go over several sessions. Your character will level up. Mm. You'll get new skills. You'll increase your stats. However, they're concentrating, and they've concentrated all the material that's come out so far, on the cinematic session, which is basically play one movie. Cool. It gives you a three-act structure and gives every character an agenda in three parts. So as as you go into the next act, you'll get a new agenda. If you complete your agenda, you get bonus dice to spend later in the game. Ooh! So there's an ins- there's a real incentive to actually do the agenda because it's not just a tick in the box or well done pat on the back. You actually get something which helps the game further on. And those agendas are brilliant because I know what they all are and they are beautiful. And it's even better knowing what people decisions people are making because they're making them based on their agenda. And everyone else going, "What are you doing?" Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, one, one... I don't want to give anything away in case someone listens because no, totally, you did say totally. last... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You went into, in, we went into a particular area and everyone was like, why are you doing this? Oh, there might be decent stuff in here. And it's like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one character got into a huff because of something and somebody else went to somebody else to do something. And you're like, oh, they're totally trying to screw somebody over or they're doing this. And of course, as players, we don't know what they are. So we're all thinking, what are they up to? What are they up to? What's their agenda? What are they What are they planning? So the, it, it sets the tone so well. Um, I thought it was brilliant. So I'm really looking forward to playing Alien again. It's a, a D6 system? Yes, it's. Um, I think it's called the Mutant System. Right. Because it's originally from Mutant Year Zero. Mm-hmm. So it's also the same system they put into... Tales from the Loop. That's it, yes. Mm. So the same basic system as Tales from the Loop, apart from the Alien, has got the stress system, which doesn't appear in the other games. Mm. Okay. So the Alien system basically goes, you accumulate stress, and for each point of stress you get, you'll roll an extra die, which means you've got more chance of getting a success. But the stress die are different die, and if you get a one near them, you panic, and then we roll on the panic table and see what happens. Very interesting. It's great. I'm really looking forward to playing again. Whilst on a similar theme, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys... Oh, you are familiar with Nightmare Live. I've mentioned it a few times. You have, yes. Indeed. And you two still haven't been. No. You love it. It's awesome. No. Um, they are running, because of the lockdown, Paul Flannery, who plays Treyguard in the live shows, is running basically a, a live session on Facebook about half past four every Friday. And he's basically going through the Choose Your Own Adventure books that are for Nightmare... So he's oh, reading right. he's reading from the book, like, you know, page one, this cool. is, you're outside a castle and blah, 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 blah. Do you greet the knight outside the castle or do you ignore him and run around the side to try and find the side door? And if there's always a decision, if, when there's a decision, um, the audience will vote on it. So he puts like a little voting thing out and the audience basically sort of vote. And that's the, the, the overriding vote. And that's the, the, the page you'll turn to. And it's really cool because lots of comments going on, lots of laughs. It's slightly lighthearted, obviously. And it's bloody difficult. And the number of times that we as an audience have died is quite hilarious. <laughs> it's really, really good fun. So he's doing this basically because he's he's a you know a full time actor essentially. So Nightmare Live and stuff is his livelihood. So he's on there doing doing this. And you can donate to to his Kofi coffee, which I've done on our behalf, I might add. Um, so I bought him a, a quiche and a, a coffee because <laughs> it's basically at the start of one of these adventures, you can you get a choice of various things you can take into the dungeon with you, and one of them is a quiche. <laughs> that, that's part of your starting equipment. As part of your starting equipment, you can take into the dungeon a quiche. Instead of a spell, now we don't have a spell, let's take a quiche. We need something to put into that little knapsack before the whole brain floating away and yeah, you happens. have you know, life force levels green, amber, and red. 
Um, it's it's ace, and he's got all the little sound effects and plays the music. It's brilliant. It's really good. It's very camp and very 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 lighthearted, but it is good fun. So I strongly recommend people go and go and watch that. Speaking of things people should go and do as well, the Steve, you're a bastard and you're forcing me to spend money again. Well, what have I done now? You pointed out the humble bundle this time around. Oh yes, I'm I'm so glad I I've got most of those games already. I'm not because I bought most of them last week. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> like um, um, Splendor and a couple of others. But yeah, the humble bundle this time around. The As- it's called the Asmodee Digital Play with Friends, uh, and it's available. I think until the twenty first of May, and there's about eleven day- uh, ten days left, and this is the eleventh of May now. But it's got loads and loads and loads of digital board game apps uh, within the bundle. So things like Splendor, Scythe, Carcassonne with shitloads of expansions, Mysterium with the expansions, Small World 2. There's loads and loads and loads of ones in there. And for, I think it's about a tenner, you can get all of this stuff. Can't remember, is it ten pound fifty or nine pound fifty something it's like that? Nine pound fifty. I think I was thing. generous and gave him a bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, so you go on there, and it, it's it's well worth it, even if you've got two or three of them. Well, t- to be fair, I've been w- keeping my eye on the Lord of the Rings card game for some time, and I bought it about three or four weeks back when it was on sale, and I think I paid eight pound for it. There you go, done. So it's worth it just to get the Lord of the Rings game mm. and then you get all the carcass and expansions and everything else with it as well. It's true. I really am annoyed that this came out because <laughs> I just held... Because I haven't even installed the copy of Lord of the Rings yet. So I just oh. held out a couple of weeks. I could have had them all for a bargain price. Yeah. I mean, I got the Scythe app for half price and that was £7.50. So it's full price is 15 quid normally. And you can get all you get mm-hmm. it in here for, for you know less than a tenner. So because uh, I already have it, if anyone uh, wants a free copy of the Scythe digital board game app, first come, first serve, drop me a message. Rory, it's yours. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, audience. You say that Nightmare Live Online is happening because the real Nightmare Live has been cancelled. Uh, yeah, so basically, obviously, because there's no, you're not allowed major gatherings mm. uh, anymore. So, yes, it's 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 taken to the digital format. Well, at least they can do that, though. Last week, on the last, sorry, that, on the last episode, sorry, we said how UK Games Expo was still going ahead. Mm. And we were right at time of recording, <laughs> and they changed the news the day we published the episode. Yeah. <laughs> As, of course, they did. As the course did. So UK Games Expo 2020 has been cancelled. Who is? What do you think the chances are of by the time this is released, it's been uncancelled and relaunched again? Just 94%. Just Just because we're going on record now saying it's been cancelled. Also, Tabletop Scotland has been cancelled. I do feel sorry for them because they rescheduled once. Mm. Yeah. I really wanted to go this year. I could actually go because Duncan keeps uh, keeps pestering me to go every year because obviously I love Scotland and, and was lived up there for, for, for yonks. And this year, Laura and I were like, yes, let's go. We can make a holiday in Scotland. We both like going to Scotland. Let's go to Tabletop Scotland. We'll see everybody there. No, we can't anymore. Stupid virus. Well, it was originally supposed to be the weekend in August, and then when UK Games Expo rescheduled, they rescheduled oh, for the same weekend in August. No. So Tabletop Scotland rescheduled Re-rescheduled. again. rescheduled Yeah. <laughs> and then cancelled. At time of recording, we are 18 days away from the actual launch of the original date of UK Games Expo. Yeah. So it had COVID mm. not happened, I'd be like knee deep in like my planning and my spreadsheets and getting my map ready. This would probably be our preview episode. You're probably, probably right. Yes. It would be, yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, you'd be pl- you'd be planning the shit out of it, and Steve and I would have done f- cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's not quite true. All the work I've bit, avoided, and it would have all gone to pot as soon as mm. I walked through that door. Yes, mm. and scatter. We don't scatter. <laughs> I don't scatter. I stick to tightly. Planned plan. I know. I remember last year I got dragged around on a f-ing choke chain. Right, Lewis, we're going to this demo now. <laughs> and Sit how many here. good games did I steer you to, Andy? None. Oh. <laughs> we only sat down at one between the two of us, and that was Mark, what was going to be Marquesas. 
Two. What was the other Two. one? No, you sat us down like a Norrell game as well. I'm not forgiving you for that. Uh, yeah, all, okay, right, yeah. Norrell, uh, my case ass, uh, magnate, life form. Okay, life form I'll give you. But didn't you drag it, Rory to life form? I though? did, actually, yeah. So there. No, you so didn't. Yeah. I'd scheduled it in with Tristan. Had you? Yeah. Were you not there? Or were you there? And my memory playing tricks? No, I was... Yeah, I was there because that, that was the day that you and I snuck in early. That was a Saturday. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. I remember because I, I was the gribbly and I ate you all. That yeah. was good. That was fun. And Steve and John were meant to join us, but they went to go get coffee. That's right. Yeah. Okay. One, one out of four. Not bad. Well done. <laughs> I'm sure there were others. Sanctum. Anyway. <laughs> one th- convention which is still going ahead is Tabletop Gaming Live. <gasps> You, now you've said that a week today when this mm. when this gets published. Nail in the coffee. Yeah. That's yeah. it. It's game over now. <laughs> Within 24 hours before or after this episode gets published, it will be cancelled. Should we record an alternative ending to this podcast just in <laughs> case you need to do a last minute edit? <laughs> like good all, all live broadcasters do. So yes, that's the 26th and 27th of September. Alexandra Palace in London. I've got to admit, if it goes ahead... It's going to be big. I can... Im- I reckon it's going to be bigger this year, yeah. So it'll be yeah. the only one that anyone can get to. The problem is it's in bloody London. It's in going to be a pain in the ass area of London it, as well. It's not just to get in to. London, it's in Alexander Palace, which is not easy to just pop into Ooh. either. Yeah, if you don't live in London, it's not near any of the major stations, is it? No. So you've got to get into the hub of London and then travel another hour to get to Alexander Palace. Yeah, you went, is it last year you went, Steve, or was it two years ago? No, year before, or two Jeez, years ago. So I, did, I went to the first one, I didn't go to the second one. That's right. Because of that, it was like, I could get to it, but by the time I, as you said, get to London, get across London, mm. you know, it's, it's two and a half hours for me to get into London, and it was another hour and a bit to get from Paddington to the actual Alexandra Palace. So it was a long day. And I suppose we're, in many ways we're quite spoiled because the expo is so big and we all live an hour away from it, max. Yeah. Mm. And that's kind of, that's our standard, isn't it, really? Where, whereas some people yeah. have to travel two and a half hours a to get way. to the NEC. Yeah. It's yes. true. I can, I can do it in 40 minutes if, um, if there's no traffic. <clears throat> <laughs> At no jeopardy to your car whatsoever. Absolutely none. On a related note as well, mm. I found out this week that Tabletop Gaming is now available on Readly. Oh. So Readly is a magazine subscription app. It's like a digital magazine app where you put it on your iPad or your phone and you pay a standard about a month and it gives you like unlimited access to magazines. Okay. Hmm. Now, Amanda originally booked it, uh, bought it because she wanted these like gardening and lifestyle magazines and basically just looks at things and goes, oh, that's pretty. How much? Yeah, good <laughs> housekeeping. Yeah, that's yeah. Ex- exactly, good housekeeping is exactly yep. it. And I was a bit annoyed at first because it was like, oh, tabletop gaming isn't on here. You mm. know, there's, um, there's a couple of video game ones, there's a couple of music production ones I've been there flicking through. But I was just flicking through it today, nosing. It's like, oh, not only have they put tabletop gaming on, they've put the entire backlog on. Nice. So it's like, right, okay, that's me occupied. Do you know what? Is, do you know if Gardener's World's on there? Yes, because Gardener's World turned up there this week as well. Right. Yeah. In that case, now I have a good legitimate excuse to get a subscription because I can read tabletop gaming and I can give Gardener's World to Laura because she's, she's an avid plant grower. Mm. I do all the landscaping and the hard work. She just sticks things in the ground. <laughs> like I have my own garden. <laughs> That's a good shout. I think Readly might be getting a subscription. How much is a subscription? Uh, I think it's like seven or eight pounds a month. So oh, it's not, not too bad. cheap. But if you yeah if you only really read like one or two magazines it's not cheap but if you if you read a few it you know, evens out kind of thing. But I suppose even at seven or eight pounds that is the price of like two magazines, two magazines. these days, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I keep uh, that's the thing. I keep forgetting that. I've, it's been so long since I've actually bought a physical magazine. I keep thinking there's still two or three quid each. No, they're best part of a yeah. five now, aren't they? Yeah, but, I remember reading like you know Amstrad Action and Amiga. Um, Amiga, Amiga, format. Amiga format, yeah, and they were like, you know, one <laughs> quid, one quid fifty back then. You know, two quid if you got free CD on the front, you know, free in inverted commas. Um, but you're like, wow, two pounds, that's loads for a magazine, and now five of. I remember Zap 64 was less than a pound. <gasps> God, yes. It's like you guys are speaking a different language. 
<laughs> I have no idea what any of those things are. Amstrad Action was amazing because I had a an Am, Amstrad was Amstrad CPC four six four with a color monitor. Was my is first that, Is that one of C three PO's friends? Yes, it's older than C three PO. <laughs> daddy, C three PO's daddy, but it had an inbuilt tape drive. <laughs> oh yeah, tape drive. Tape drive, baby. Tape drive, oh. which you had to have to, you had to adjust the tracking because it. it would never work yeah. first time. Or smack it one. Yeah. See, I remember um, the first computer magazine buying was one for the Acorn Electron because that was my first computer, and it didn't come with a game on the cover. It came with the basic code inside, <gasps> and you had to type copy it, it out and type it yourself. Mm. And this was back in the day before you had um, development environments, so if you made a mistake on a single line of code, you had to do the whole lot again. And there was <laughs> yes. usually like 4,000 lines of code. 10. Yeah. CLS. 20. Ready. <laughs> 30. Rem. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yes. Poke. <laughs> poke. <laughs> I remember pokes. Oh, yes. That was all. We're always fun. looking at like as if we're just crazy people now. We are crazy clue. people. We, we spent our free time doing that shit. Uh. Uh, a, po- a poke was a thing you actually typed in before you loaded the game to break the game. Hmm. So it would like give you infinite lives or turn off sprite detection so you could just like walk through enemies or something like that. But you had to type it in before the game loaded. So it was like a pre bit of code. And then you loaded the game on top of it. And it and you right. didn't know you'd made a mistake until you'd loaded the game and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it took 15 minutes to load a game. Yes. So it's not like the 30 seconds you get on, a, on an SSD these days. It's crazy. Ah, good old days. Uh, more things have happened although to be fair this next this next thing we've got on our list is is probably known by every man dog and stationary object these days Frosthaven I think everyone I think pretty much the entire board gaming world has backed this did did anyone hear back it? no not interested maybe <gasps> you did did you Andy? maybe there's, have you turned off <laughs> notifications? There's rumours. I have not turned off notifications. I didn't. I haven't been notified. No, it didn't grass you up. Did it not? No. Oh, oh. Well, I've been grassed up now, well and truly. <laughs> but yes, Frosthaven just just made its funding target with a pitiful twelve point nine million dollars. It was about fair play. ten grand short of thirteen mil. It was insane which now makes it the highest funded board game ever to be done on Kickstarter and the third biggest Kickstarter project of all time. So the previous... Really? Who was... Was it... Uh, was it? I want to say Exploding Kittens or something like that was the highest No, one. it was... Um, Kingdom Death Monster. It was KDM, yeah. That was yeah. it, yeah. That was about 9 mil, I think the last one was. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, but Kingdom Death Monster was like 500 quid a copy, yeah. so it's not surprising in a way. And they still yeah. haven't delivered all of that, have they? Have they not? I'm, no, I don't think so. I'm, no. I'm sure the delivery date for kind of the last stuff was 2021. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, yes, you're right. I remember looking at that thinking, when? Fuck <laughs> off. Mm. <laughs> it says the man who's backed something that won't be delivered until the end of next year, but never mind. <laughs> but they did it in stages, so if you actually played the game in bits, the bits would come out as and when you played yeah. them as well. Oh, that's quite so interesting. So it was quite yeah. clever how they did that. But and the still. minis were quite. The minis are quite nice. Mm. The minis are bonkers. Mm. Those dragons are mental. The, 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 there's some weird minis in there as well, mm. though. There are. The boob monster is just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something from um, that should be in Duke Nukem. It's not far off. Something that should be in Duke Nukem. It's got that kind of Duke Nukem Eve doomy vibe. Yeah. It's just a monster covered in boobs. It's just it, it's just weird and it's sick and um, yeah. We should move on. Mm. Yeah, we probably should. Anyway, yeah, back to Frosthaven. I think congratulations to Isaac Childress, actually, because he has built that game from scratch, hasn't he? Yes. Yeah. You know, this is not a big company. It's more or less just him. Of course, he's got artists and other people to help him now, but for him to have achieved that, I am I know there were a lot of people whinging and going, eh, it's just the same game as the last one. So? With a bit of snow on top. Yeah, but people want it. I mean, we love Gloomhaven. I would. I was tempted to get it myself, but then thought I've played about three missions of Gloomhaven. Mm. So I, I thought to... that as well, but then I thought, <laughs> <"Kid."> <laughs> 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 "Oh, 
Andy Lewis in grown up shocker. <laughs> Well, to be honest, at the moment, because we're all in lockdown, I'm not. I've got yeah, I've got a very expensive, very thirsty car sat on the drive that I'm not using. So I've got a lot of petrol money burning a hole in my pocket. And Might you've also well got to consider something that with all the conventions for the rest of the year cancelled, your car's unlikely to break down until next year. Off. <laughs> Doesn't break down; it breaks permanently. Yeah, when it hits things. <laughs> yes. Well. Let's not talk about that. Let's move swiftly on. Although, to be fair, it has already been in the garage this year, but nothing to do with my driving. It just had a particularly... It had an oil leak, an aircon leak, and a water leak at the same time, which cost me about a £1,000. Mm. Mm. But now it's all fixed and it's fine, so we can move swiftly on. So we've, we've talked about news. We've talked about RPGs and uh, board games is, is what we also talk about on this podcast. I haven't played any. The, the one game I've been playing uh, most recently is what games put my laptop at the optimum height for me to work at. So what boxes do I put under my laptop <laughs> to raise it up to the screens at the right level? Uh, and these games are? Um, I, I'm using the Dungeons & Dragons starter set box and my uh, Broken Token Pandemic case. And I've worked nice. that those two raise it just right. I could probably do with another slim one, but I need quite a slim game. Are they um, HM government PPE uh, regulation <laughs> guideline approved? Because isn't oh, there yes. like, if you, if you get, if you're working in an office, obviously you've got to have about 150 po- adjustable points on your chair these days yep. and your desk has got to fold up into about four different bits and the monitor has to be millimetre perfect at the right height to basically be not comfortable for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's the only thing I've been doing with my board games recently. What about you guys? I have been playing many games. I've been playing a few games. Mm. I wouldn't say many. Are you getting them to the, the physical table, or are you still playing a lot online? Nah. No chance. Just online for me at the moment. Uh, no, I, you see, I play games with my housemate, so it's, uh, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's got to the point now where, uh, where Laura is actually buying games of her own accord and learning rules. She has properly gone full nerd now. It's great. So she's actually taught me how to play Raiders of the North Sea. Mm. Mm. See, tell a lie, I've played one game with Amanda since we last chatted, mm. which is actually a, kick, a game which is on Kickstarter right now. And I think by the time this podcast goes out, it might have actually finished. It's called Metropia. That sounds like some kind of condition. It does. To boil it down into its simplest uh, explanation, it's like Go with extra steps. Isn't Go Uh, the game with loads of steps? Go the little one with black and white tokens? Go is the one with black and white tokens. Just put a token down, that's basically it, isn't it? Oh, right, okay. Not the MB, is it MB or Waddington's game from about 1970 or something where you had to fly around the world on business trips that was also called Go. That was still Go, cool, wasn't yeah. it? Yes, I do remember that. I quite now. enjoyed that, actually. That was quite a good fun <laughs> game as a, as a child. And it was Roll and Move, which is obviously something that we hate now. But um, at the time, it was quite interesting. So Metropia is a Greek... Well, the, the, the cover's Greek myth, but it's there's Vikings in there, there's samurai in there. Yeah, but it's a, basically fancy battle is the concept. You've got a hexagonal map. You're putting your colour tokens down the board. The way in which the tokens go down is based on what cards you have in your hand. Mm-hmm. So the cards have a kind of a, a little map on them and show you where you can you choose a token, which is the central one, and you can place another one down. Oh, like Onitama. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just like just like Onitama. Yeah, but imagine that. But the card gets completely discarded once you've played yeah, it. Yeah. And you're taking you're putting tokens on the board, not moving them around. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Yeah. So the idea is you basically claim territories and when you surround certain, if you completely surround the uh, opposition's tokens, their tokens come off the board and you've captured them and they go in your on your board to give you points. There's also some extra things like it, there's different factions and each faction's got a little special ability and there's also like these instant play cards like you can do a move and then play a card to put several tokens down rather than one or do two goes at once or something like that. Okay. Any good? I don't really know because I am terrible at it. Oh. <laughs> Amara, Amanda beat me in like three moves and went, you've never played Go before, have you? And I went, 
no, why? She goes, because this is go, and this proves you're rubbing at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's never been one to mince her words, that girl, is she? No. <laughs> you're shit and you're beneath me. Be gone. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I... It is go with extra steps. It looks pretty... From the point where they sent me the prototype and sent me and sent me a PDF for the rules, they actually cut a lot of stuff out, which was good because it was a bit overly complex at first. The rule book is terrible. Mm. I mean, it it you know we get we get us all here played Kickstarter prototypes, and anyone that complains about a rule book should try and play a Kickstarter prototype because they're always infinitely worse. Mm. And this is one of those ones where it's using words and you're going, I don't think you understand what that word means. Now, I think it's been translated from Polish or okay. Czechoslovakian into English. Via Chinese. Like that. Mm, yeah, it feels like it sometimes. It just doesn't describe very well some of the basic concepts. Mm. I can't say I'm a fan. I can't say I'm going to play this much. And I also think we play it two-player. Although it's playable two to five players, it sounds like it's a game which is really going to reward the higher player count yeah it's another one of those which i'm never gonna have a chance to look at yeah you know anytime soon so but it is on um i think it's on tabletop simulator okay there's the opportunity to play it on there personally i'm not a fan though what they've done is i mean it looks nice you know it's it's even the prototype components are pretty nicely done nice artwork it's all nice brightly colored tokens so if you fancy the idea of like a more advanced version of go it's worth a look, but not for me. Not for you. Okay. All right. Whilst on Tabletop Simulator, was it mm. last week? Oh, yes. We were invited by Cesar of Alley Cat Games ah, yes. to have a go at um, his new prototype, which I think is going to be hitting, hopefully hitting Kickstarter later this year, if all goes well, although... Obviously, that is very much situationally dependent, given on what happens, <laughs> called Eternal Palace. Now, this made our most anticipated games of the year article at the beginning, back in January. Did you see ours? Mine. Was that your, it, one of it yours? It was mine, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, I was really quite intrigued by it. The, the look of it, uh, the little easel thing, and I spoke to Cesar, and it sounded quite cool. It sounded like a, like a middle, middleweight Euro game. Yeah, that's probably not yes. unreasonable, yeah. Yeah. It is pretty, although I said, oh, the board looks quite nice, and Cesar basically said, yeah, that's not fine. It looks shite at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a few tweaks they need to do to the artwork, obviously, because it's, it is still obviously an early prototype mm-hmm. stage, so that's to be that's to be expected. But yes, it is a middleweight Euro. It's a dice placement game. It's I'm not going to say it's a dice drafting game, but it's because it, it is and it isn't because you have your own set of dice. But what you do with that set of dice is you can kind of pick and choose how to split them up and where to put them. So there are 13, but mostly 12 areas of the board, and they all do different things like give you resources or give you um, get you up a little track or give you control of a, a situation. And you need to use these in combination to either take control of a monument or mm. get influence i can't remember what it's called wisdom i think it was wasn't it yeah and you basically there's a bunch of these little tracks that you go up at each of these spaces and the first person to get to the top of the track gets like a little token and it gives them um, a glory point Mm. and most points wins at the end of the game but as part of doing all of this you start to build the picture which is where this easel comes in and that's where that because the theme of this game is you are was it rebuilding a a monument or something after a war or am i am i misremembering or has it changed slightly the Emperor, it's, it's, if I remember, I can't remember exactly, but I think the Emperor is basically trying to sort something out and you are trying to show that you love him and that you care about the world and by taking care of these monuments and making sure that these things get built, then you are showing that you're devoted so to the, him, something like that. There's an artistic theme of creating like the beauty of everlasting monuments, you know, things that are going to like mark a generation. A period of time, is that Yes, it? I, think, yeah. I think it's probably the, the short answer, yes. I can't <laughs> honestly remember exactly the story behind it because Cesar didn't honestly go into a huge amount of detail about the background. We were more concerned about whether the game was bust or not. Um, it turns out it's not. So let's check on BGG. Players are tasked with helping the Emperor rebuild prestige of a now derelict palace. Ah, okay. So you are noble families hoping, uh, wishing to gain favour with the Emperor to rebuild the palace to its former glory and paint a picture of its momentous occasion. Okay. 
yeah, as Andy says, what you're doing is you're you're building up these resources and then using them to get these monuments. All the spots on the board lead to a piece of the painting. Mm-hmm. So you can only get each piece of the painting once. Okay. Which also makes it quite interesting. So what you want to do is you can't concentrate on one thing. You need to diversify because you need to go, you know, you need to make sure you're up this track, that track, and this track to get those pieces and have held the this temple, that monument or whatever it is to get these items. And each painting piece is basically worth a point at the end of the game. If you get to the top, you get this glory point, which gives you an additional piece, which is worth another point. And the, the beautiful thing is that you can stack these paintings up, these these piece of picture up in any order you like. So once you look at them on the easel, it's created this lovely sort of scene um, okay. with sort of grass in the foreground and buildings as they go back and almost like, you know, this multi-layered picture building affair that you get in some some um, in some pictures. And it all looks very pretty. The one criticism I think Steve and I both have of it is it is entirely unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's gimmicky because they don't actually serve any other purpose other than to look pretty you know you could just get a coin to say i've got a point but one could argue that miniatures on a board game such as like nemesis are superfluous they're just there to look pretty as well they do serve a purpose though i mean yes you could use a token or you, you could use a token or that's a... fair enough yes but they do still serve a purpose as in there is something there prosing a threat for example whereas mm. these literally do nothing you could get little coin to say i have a point because that's literally all it's worth in the game the put the picture doesn't do anything it doesn't score you any points um for making it pretty you don't all vote on who makes the best one or anything so, like that it's literally just there to look nice so can i ask then when you talked about that the pieces of the picture are all on these different tracks and that you're in therefore encouraged to diversify if they were just points would that then devalue it, I mean, it, no, 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 they are just points. That it would, it'd be just like it'd be like saying you can imagine if they were just tokens. You could only get that token if you got that track. Okay, and each to each token is worth the same amount of points. Yes. Yes. So it doesn't matter whether it's foreground or background in terms of the aesthetic. Correct. No. Yeah. So your encouragement to go up these tracks is only to get. I can only get this one point if I go up this track, but I can equally yes. just go up this track and get a point here anyway. Yes. Yes. Okay, but then. Is and, not the point and, of the uh, building this easel then to create that that physical incentive to create a fuller picture? Because you wouldn't if you just went at one track and you just got I don't know, having not played it, if there are five points at this one track, I can just go up that one point. Oh, no, 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 no. There's, there's there's one, one point one up point. that one track. Oh, right. That's okay. the whole point. So there's one point per track. There's one there's there's all these places where you can put these dice. And there's one point per oh, right. okay. dice location. So that's what I'm saying. You have to diversify. So basically, there's, there's the point, places where you can put your die come into two categories, gather resources yeah. or spend the resources to take control. So there's bonus points for controlling the three monuments, was it, Andy? Yeah, it was because it was three resources. Yeah. Three, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's three. you get bonus points for controlling the monument at the end of the game. Okay. But the monuments cost more and more to control as the game goes oh, on. Because every time... Wood. Yes, the four. Wood, so, amber, yes. Um, stone, and that white stuff. I can and never remember the name of it. Uh, pottery. Yeah, it, clay. It, it, yeah, I can't remember the proper name, clay, but it was pottery clay, yeah. So basically, yeah, what the, what the game really is, it's a fight over these locations because every time someone overtakes a location, they add another resource to the pile, which makes it more expensive for the next person to come in. Oh, okay. So what you're doing is you're going up the tracks. The get going up the tracks ones get you resources, but when you get to the top of the track, you will get a piece of the painting. And if you're the first person, you'll get a bonus piece of the painting. Oh, okay. It's usually a little, a little foreground item like a little top monument. And the person who owns these is controlling these temple these items at the end of the game gets another bonus point. Now where the I thought the painting fell down is I triggered. Did I win? Yes, you did win. I did win, yes. Sorry. I know I triggered the end of the game. I couldn't remember if I'd won. You did. So I triggered the end of the game, and the, end, the game ends when one person has so many pieces of painting. Nice. Oh. But at the end of the game, I couldn't use all the pieces of painting. I had too many. Not too many score points, too many to physically stack them up and make something that looked sensible. Oh. So at the end of the game, I could choose and pick and choose which pieces of painting I wanted to put onto my easel to make a pretty painting, but it made no difference to the game because by that point, I'd already won. Oh. 
So do you still score points for all of the points you collect? Yeah, yeah. So you still, you, yeah. all right, so you still score for all the points, not just what's on your easel. Yeah. Okay, so I think for, that would probably make more sense if you only scored for what you could put on your easel. Therefore, you'd be incentivized to spread out across. I don't know. You, you're looking at me like I'm talking shite. So. <laughs> you're incentivized to spread out anyway because you have to, because you can only score each location once yeah, yeah. and then you get the bonus points for controlling them. Oh. So it's all, I mean, right, we're getting. We are getting bogged down with the gimmick side of it, which is these painting pieces. Oh. And as I said, the game would work just as well as if there were a num- set of numbered tokens numbered 1 to 13. Yeah. Because that's effectively what they're doing. They're just saying, I can only get token 3 once. Once I've got token 3, I can't grab that token again. Okay. That's all it is. Which is regardless, because the game itself is really good. Agreed. I really enjoyed it. Oh. Okay. You've got, you've got six resources you've got to juggle. So not only have you got the four physical resources you need to grab these um, these like spaces that are in contention, you've also got fishes and... Fishes. I can't remember the name of the other one, Andy. Uh, fish and wisdom. Wisdom, that was it. So fish, you have to pay fish to other players if you want to go on the same space where they've already put dice. Which Steve did a lot. I got a lot of Which fish Which I had to do a lot because I was, I was the last player to go in every single round. <laughs> and you play wisdom to do things like change. The, you can change like the value of your dice up or down mm. one for each wisdom you spent. And one of the really good things about this, because this is a personal bugbear of mine of dice placement games, is the board is well diversified. So no matter what you roll, there's always something that you can do. Mm. And you can always spend the wisdom to change the dice roll to go to other places. Okay. Because I really had, what was it, Cavern Tavern we played, wasn't it, Andy, mm-hmm. years ago? And that wound me up because that was a game that rewarded you better the higher you rolled. Uh. Yeah, the thing is, with Cavern Tavern, I will give you a caveat. I, I don't disagree with you, but there is a small expansion to Cavern Tavern, which you should probably play with, to be honest, because that does allow you to modify your score. Mm. You get little tokens. So the, in in Eternal Palace, the reward for rolling double six is just as useful as a reward for rolling double one. Nice. So the the actual value is the value is irrelevant. It's the the actual dice yeah. face that you're still going to place. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. And what you do as well is you roll a whole bunch of dice and secretly choose to group them. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you have you roll four dice at the beginning, and you could actually go to four different places with single dice values, or you could put it into two pairs, or a three and a one. Mm. And you have to do that secretly. And then you reveal them all, and then everyone places them down. There's nothing worse than going, uh, reveal the dice, and everyone's picked seven. It's like, oh, God, I'm going to have to spend a fortune in fish now. And I-, I do love a game that has a reveal aspect. Yes, I really nice. like you, that. You should totally play Trickerian if you haven't played that. So this is kind of like Trickerian light, basically. I made, made this comment during the, when we were playing it, actually, as well. It's, oh, it's like Trickerian. And so I was like... Kind of, yes, but nowhere near as hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Trickerian is like that. Like you kind of like you break you break your brain in Trickerian doing that. You basically you've got to decide basically where you where in town you want mm. to send your little minions, and then of course you don't reveal them all at once. But then you 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 you've kind of because you've got cards that face down, you just reveal one at a time. But of course, if somebody goes where you want to go and all the spots are taken up, you basically lose the lose the ability to go yeah. there. Whereas in this, it's a little more kind. As Steve says, you basically pay a fish or two fish or however many people are already there, so you can still go, but it costs you. A it's, bit more. There's a cost to it. Yeah, or you can just go somewhere else because you've got these modifiers, you've got this wisdom that allows you to change the dice value. You could say, oh, crap, I, don't, I, I can't go to the six anymore. I don't have any fish. I'll go to number five instead and do whatever number five is and just, just spend a wisdom instead. So there's a bit more flexibility to it, which is quite nice because you can partially adjust mm. your plans on the fly, which helps. So can I ask for that? In terms of dice, placing the dice on the board, that's obviously determined by turn order. And Steve, you said you were last in every turn of the game. Was that yeah. was, did did you get a chance to change the turn order and just didn't do it or? It's determined by the results of your dice rolls. So before you take your dice back behind the counter, everyone rolls their dice mm. in plain view and adds them all up. Oh, okay. So everyone, you can you can see what your opponents have rolled, and if you're really good at you know photographic memory and maths, you can remember what everyone's got. No one obviously does. But then you add them all up, and the person with the lowest score goes first. The person with the highest score goes last. Oh, okay. And so the Steve, you were game, just unlucky over that. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, be, yeah, because of that, uh, the person who is 
la or first on the like one of the the, the tracks that basically the top of this game that's the tracks of the ultimate track track if you're first on that you get another die first as well every round someone gets a new die and the person basically who's furthest around this track i think is the tiebreaker essentially so you'll get a die so it just turns out that steve got his die first which mm. means he's rolling four dice instead of me and cesar rolling three yeah. which means he was inevitably probably statistically going to be last, last. eternal yes that makes sense because he's it's got more scores so okay so it uh, seems it like it's quite balanced as well in in determining so you guys enjoyed the game then? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we did. It was it was it was interesting. It was I think the right amount of thinking. There's a little bit of downtime when everyone is sort of thinking about what to do with their dice, but because it's kind of shared downtime, it's never that bad. Because mm. once once the uh, the turns go, it's like well you kind of know what you're already going to do unless you really need to rethink because somebody does something that you yeah, weren't expecting. Unless you're completely scuppered. But I suppose that's that's expected or allowed downtime then, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's never really that bad because you don't really have that many options. Mm. You know, if you unless you've got a million of these um, little wisdom tokens, which you will never have, mm. you might have two or three uh, most of the time. Then you can only really change your score by one or two points, which only gives you, you know, a couple of options that you need to basically consider. So it's never that bad. So, yeah, it's, it, it rattled along reasonably quickly. I think we got through the whole demo in, what, two hours? Yeah, something like cool. that, and, uh, and that's with tabletop simulator, mm. slow, you know, mm. reduced time, and with learning the game. Was being yeah. taught the rules. Yeah. Cool. yeah, so it's pretty good. And coming to Kickstarter later this year, any idea on a uh, standard pledge level? Don't know. It might be next year. Depends on mm. obviously what what um, Ali Cat ended up doing because I know they've got a they've got a couple of projects that they're still trying to sort of fulfil. So. Mm. Okay. It just it's it's all about timing at the so, moment. I think they're they're planning to either late this year or early next year to to run the Kickstarter. Yeah, Desar did say he wants to make sure some of the projects are at the door first. Mm. Yeah, because no, community care, the Dice Hospital expansion has hit some uh, a delay coming out anyway before yeah. before all of this lockdown nonsense. And one last thing before we move on, it, Cesar did mention to me that he was potentially going to give you guys a sneak peek at another game after you finished Eternal Palace? That may or may not have happened. It may, may not have happened. Oh, yes. okay. Should we tell him or not, Steve? Well, I know what flipping game it is, Andy, because <laughs> I had a conversation with Cesar. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what we were allowed to say and what we're not. Fair enough, okay. um, I, t- t- we'll we'll, we we'll take it offline, guys. We'll take it offline. Yes. No, 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 no. We are allowed, I think we're allowed to talk about it, but not just not allowed to give any detail. Yeah. Well, I think okay, if it's the same game I'm thinking of, it was also in the my uh, most anticipated games of 2020 because back in January, this was potentially going to be a December release. Yes. Yeah, I think based on what we've seen, it's going to be in your potentially great games for 2021. Brilliant. That's one part yes. of the article yes. I don't have to write again. Yes. It sounded very interesting. Uh, it's it's very early prototype at the moment. There's still a lot of things being tweaked and changed. And um, should we tell our audience what game we're talking about before we start talking about it? Uh, <laughs> Dice Theme Park. Dice Theme Park. It's the sequel, the spiritual sequel to Dice Hospital. Dice Hospital, based yeah. on the very popular video game of Theme Park. And theme, theme Park, yes, yes. And it's actually got. Is it one of the designers from? I want to say Sagrada and Bosk. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, it is. Yes. I forget his name. Um, but also um, the, the, Mike, the original Mike Nudd designer as well, of Dice Hospital and Mike Nudd's involved as well. So it's a combination from from the lot of them. So, mm. but uh, yeah, it's it's still undergoing lots of tweaks, lots of changes, lots of obviously just the design process at the moment. So um, we can't mm. really say much more than that because we honestly haven't seen any more than that. No. We saw the basic components, which were still, you know, very much designed in Excel mm. kind of prototype, mm. and we saw the you know, the basic mechanics about how the dice are going to work, which was actually pretty cool. It's different. It is different to Dice Hospital. It's not Dice Hospital with a different skin. No. It is a different game, which is quite interesting. Mm. But he's gone for the similar kind of like the rides, for instance, are hexagonal tiles yeah. in the same way departments in Dice Hospital where so you can say you can see how your ride's going to build that. And I think he said spatial. Where they are is going to matter as well. Good. Is that right? Yes, because they feed off things that are next door. They've got little, um, there's extra little bits on each hex, if I remember rightly, and they can adjust the dice depending on which type of dice they are and where they go and if they get pushed off to, pushed off to another 
I think an adjacent because your hex, your dice in this that, game are going to be the visitors to the park, aren't they? Yes, yeah. that is correct. Yes, and it's I think the dice basically tracks their excitement level. So you want to keep them at a yeah. six for as long as possible. They stay in your park longer and they see more rides and spend more money. Basically, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if their score yeah. drops, then they leave the park. Okay, that's it. Yes. So Ooh. that's the overall yeah. room, and that's literally all we've seen. So beyond that, we really can't tell you because we haven't seen it. I can tell you I'm already excited about it. I yes. love theme park. The game, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. I really enjoyed it. I really like theme hospital as well, mm. although I'm not very good at dice hospital. I like it, but I'm crap at it. <laughs> also, speaking of, you know, I accused you of forcing me to spend money earlier on, Mr. Tudor. Yes. I am also going to accuse Cesar of forcing me to spend money because um, whilst we were talking about the um, the painting tiles from um, Eternal Palace, and he says, um, "Yeah, these are all sort of stacking up." And if you want another game like that, there's, a, oh, there's yes. another game like that on Kickstarter at the moment um, called Canvas, and it is currently still on Kickstarter. Although by the time actually by the time this this uh, podcast go out, it should still just about be on Kickstarter. There's eight days to go right now where you have transparent cards, and on the bottom of each transparent card is a little scene, and you can stack them all up as you, as you go along, so you generally basically get the similar sort of idea. Cesar was saying, that, oh, you've basically ripped off the idea of Canvas, and no, 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 no this has been around, Eternal Palace has been around mm. a lot longer in, in its form than, than, uh, than Canvas has. No one's accusing anyone of anything, seriously. But so, obviously, I've gone to, to, to Kickstarter and had a look, and, oh, that's quite pretty. Click. <laughs> <laughs> And guess what? Oh, have you done it? Did as it well, grass you up? Did it grass? Oh, did, yes, I've noticed it's, you've done it as well. Yes. Yeah, I, I did it within five minutes of you yeah. doing it. <laughs> and to be honest, it's only $49 for the lot, so it's not expensive. It was punt territory, definitely. Yeah, so uh, definitely, definitely uh, worth having a look at that one, actually, because it looks suitably different to anything I've got. Uh, and it doesn't mm. look like a big game, obviously for fifty for fifty rips. It's it's not going to be massive, but it's it's probably hopefully going to fill a, a um, an open niche I have in my collection of you know the the easier to to learn and teach sort of niche rather than all the five or so other games I've got on my shelf that I still haven't learned. <laughs> but oh yeah, speaking of Lacerda, he's going to have a new game out later this year, or at least on Kickstarter. Lacerda, he's going to have a new game out later this year, or at least on Kickstarter. Well, he does one a year, doesn't he? Uh, it's something like that, yeah. So this is a collaboration with Julian Julian Pombo, um, but it's still through Eagle Griffin. Um, it's called Mercato de Lisboa. Right. And has been described as a thinky filler tile placement game. So it's a much, much lighter game uh, compared to, you know, things like On Mars, which, to be honest, isn't difficult. Um, and, but that's going to be a much sort of smaller, lighter, you know, sort of half-hour affair rather than four-hour marathon uh, but that's going to be due to hit Kickstarter later on this year. But obviously, obviously again, mm. that depends on the situation that people are currently in. I would have thought if, they, if they've developed it far enough, I, th I would have thought that would happen because oh, yeah. they seem to be, everywhere else seems to be going ahead with most of the other Kickstarters. Kickstarter doesn't seem to have slowed down, as we saw with Frosthaven, we mentioned earlier. Yeah, there's no sign of that happening. It's true, actually. I mean, you just get money through the door, and you take you take a bit longer to develop it, and you can say, "Well, I've got you know, everyone's got COVID. We're a bit slowed down, so mm. um, the project can still go ahead. It just might do it at a slower pace." So that's probably a good point, Steve. It'd be interesting to see what the effect of COVID has had on Kickstarter. I mean, I might be speaking from quite a privileged point of view, but I'm still working, still doing my normal nine to five, mm. still pulling in my normal salary but I don't have the expense of running the car. We don't have Logan's not going to nursery. Uh, I've got all of these things that actually my expendable income, because there's so we're so restricted in what we can do, I actually have got a pot of money that we don't normally have. Well, this is it, exactly. Mm -hmm. I've got petrol so, money burning a hole in my pocket. Yeah. And I just wonder if that's going to have an effect on Kickstarter because I can pay for a game now. It's not going to turn up until next year. Well, that was always going to happen, but now I've got a little bit of extra money knocking around. Mm. Definitely, yes. And when you have a car that, that does 25 to the gallon, if you're careful. <laughs> Which you are not. <laughs> I do have a heavy right foot, it's true. It's an affliction. But it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a fair point, you know. I mean, I, I do wonder, actually, the, um, just how much online shopping, in, just in terms of, you know, board gaming and various other bits and bobs have, has taken effect and how much money Steam has made recently in the last few weeks for yeah. all the digital downloads. <laughs> it's made a lot about me, I'll tell you that. 
And my, my brother's just moved into a new place in, moved in just as we were going into lockdown in London, but everywhere shut up. So he wasn't able to buy any furniture. So he's kind of borrowed my Amazon Prime account and has literally bought everything through Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been like going through on my your orders. Card. Well, not on my card. He's but luckily oh, he's put his own card out. But I've been through my orders to go, where the hell is that Schleck animal set for the kids? It should have been here by now. I'm going, there's a there's a table, there's a bin, there's a sink, there's a dishwasher. I was all, who the <laughs> been ordering this stuff? Oh yeah. <laughs> Is that going to is that going to influence your uh, your buying? Um, you know, last time you bought this, you might yeah. be interested in this thing. So you got My, dishwashers and tumble dryers and stuff. It's what the hell is this crap? Utterly random. The stuff I get in my Amazon. You might be interested in this now. Same with Netflix Absolutely as well. Whenever fine. I go on Netflix, it's like, hey, new episodes of My Little Pony. Oh. Profiles. Set up your profiles. No, I've set up the profiles, but the kids never use the profiles because they don't understand the picture of Daredevil is for Papa, the picture of the giant orange smiley face is for you. I got it. So you've got, so Logan's watching Daredevil. The four-year-old <laughs> child is watching Daredevil smack the crap out of someone in New York. Awesome. I have, I have noticed he has been getting a lot more fighty recently. <laughs> You've just reminded me. You know, you said My Little Pony. Um, yeah. Apparently, My Little Pony is getting a D&D release. Yeah, Tales from Equestria. That's from yes. um, River Horse. Yeah, it's been out for a little... No, 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 no. The Tales, there's an actual D&D. Mm. No. My Little Pony is coming out as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that this Not morning. Not Tales from Equestria, which already exists. This is what I heard. I saw the news and went, well, it already exists. It's Tales from Equestria. Ooh. But no, there is a, 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 a D&D. Wow. My Little Pony coming yep. out. Because obviously we're going to rush out and buy that, but well, you've bought everything else. I know that's the problem. I go, <laughs> oh no, I can't buy that. That'll well, I should because the completionist is strong in me. But I can't, I can't buy My Little Pony. That'll I, I, okay. I could. I just leave it in the chest and forget <laughs> I it just ever existed. Never tell any of us. Exactly. So no, I don't have that. Don't the D and D childhood crossover that I would have to rush out and get. It would be the D and D Pokemon. I would love no. some classic Pokemon. 150 Pokemon and Dungeons and Dragons would be all over that. No. No, see, slightly different generation here, guys. You, you, you with your Amstrad Spectrum acorns, whatever they flipping were. Yeah, and I was I'm all a teenager about my... when uh, Pokemon was out, I think. Yeah, and so. Possibly I... even older. No, the Pokemon came out, yeah, late, late teens, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm. I, I think me and Andy were of that generation where we just missed Pokemon. Thankfully, it was like it was like, oh, what the hell's that on? Yeah, about? You know. what's that? Why is that custard-coloured electric rat doing? Get out! <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I think I was on the upper end of that, but I, with my little brother, he got really into it, and then he wanted mm. the got the Game Boy game for birthday or Christmas, but it was a bit too tricky for him. For parts of it, so it was like, Rory, can you help me do this? And then that was it. Down the Pokemon rabbit hole. Big. Oh dear! Yeah, but, no, I was still playing with things like He Man, actually Warhammer, and all that sort of shit. So you know, forty k and still all of that back then. Here's a crossover that you, th I think, you two will never get. You know, escape rooms. Mm -hmm. And I've done a couple of them, mm. and they're all good fun. And people, they're, they're springing up all over the place at the moment. Steve and I have, have done one Where? together for his birthday. Uh, yeah, yeah, and they were quite good fun because we did um we did this sort of basically pandemic one, didn't we? We sort of saved the universe from. A pandemic, yeah. hilariously enough. Get us on the case now. I did an online escape room on um, Sunday, yesterday, in fact. How does that work? Well, it's all done, basically, on a... It's not really an escape room. It's more of a sort of mystery where you have a pair of hands in front of you, so somebody's holding the camera. You, you basically see through their eyes, and they've just got a pair of hands. And as a team, you basically tell them <laughs> what you want to look at and what you want to do. How bizarre. That's it's really cool. good, actually. It's still you still need to take an hour, so you've got to, obviously you've got an hour to do whatever it was. And this was a this was a kind of a a mystery where you were a, somebody who was supposedly related to somebody who did a great train robber, and you tried to work out who you were related to and stuff. So you got an hour to work all of that, and you basically open this chest, and all of stuff comes out. You have got to investigate and inspect things and crack codes, and still unlock padlocks and things like that. But you have got to work out all it all goes. But yeah, it's literally just these two pairs of hands, and you're totally basically interacting with these, these pairs of hands. It's great. It was really really good. And there's loads of them online. Hmm. Very interesting. 
Yeah, and it's about, I don't know, it's about 30 quid for the for the six people. And it fills an hour. So, you know, for £5 a head for an hour of, of, of hilarious fun, it's actually pretty good. Take that. Mm. Well, I think that's about time we wrap, wrap things up, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. I, know, I, I know they went a bit Jonathan Ross then, didn't they? Gosh. <laughs> Did a little yeah, whack this thing up. Do you need you need, you uh, need yes. like three cups and a piano now, don't you? <laughs> three or two. God, that, that's an old reference now, yeah, it isn't is. it? I get I get that one though. I get that one. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you very much everyone for listening. We have been Polyhedron Collider, and this has been another Ramshackle episode. I think we should call it a Ramshackle production. Yes, yes. definitely. We, we really should, should, we should just do that. All all Ramshackle time. Productions. Yeah. <laughs> if we ever launch our own board game, we're calling it. We're, we are going to be called Ramshackle Productions. A good shout. That's a good shout. That yeah. And half the bits will be missing. So <laughs> let's let's just keep interrupting Steve. <laughs> if you enjoy what you listen to, please give us a review on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice. If you like to chat to us, we are on Twitter. We are collectively at Polyhedron C. I am at Warhoffel Madenga. I am at Sonic H with zero. I am at Rory J. Summers. And John can be found at John underscore Keege, assuming he's awake and has time to uh, respond, given he has smaller human. Um, we can also be found on Facebook, and we have a Board Game Geek Guild where we occasionally, very occasionally, post articles, reviews, etc., which is number 2726. Uh, well, we also have polyhedroncolor.com, but at the moment we're all being very slack and not actually putting anything there. But there are some old reviews. In fact, there's plenty of old reviews, so why not go there and have a peruse? Indeed. Find out where we come from, what we like, why, what makes Andy grumpy. Well, we've mentioned the uh, most anticipated games of the year, 2020, so you can go back and see yes. how wrong that is now. <laughs> you can go back and see just how many of those games are not going to come out yeah. this year. All of them. Well, that's it. Next year, just like, Delete 2020. Just increment well, it by zero. Zero. Spoiler Call alert, Tudor. Spoiler Call alert. Right, that's lunch point. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> well, again, thanks very much for listening. We'll catch you again soon. Nice one. Tatty bye. Ta-ra.